if you're watching this video, there's a pretty good chance that you have used Linux before. And if you have, you probably know at least a few commands like ls, cat, grep, removing the French language pack, and of course, sudo. But it's easy to forget that every, every command in Linux is actually its own standalone program. And just like any other program, these can have their own vulnerabilities. And sudo is no exception. That brings us to a recently published CVE. This is a critical vulnerability affecting sudo, and the exploit takes advantage of how certain versions of sudo handle the dash r flag, also known as the change root option. This vulnerability has since been patched out in recent updates, but we can still test it out. I won't dive too deep on how this exploit works on the back end. There are plenty of good articles for that already. And if you look on the NIST site, you can go down to this link right here. And you can check out a write-up from the people that originally found this vulnerability. What I will be doing is walking through how to trigger this exploit using a published proof of concept, how to play around and customize that a little bit, and then running this exploit in two different uh, scenarios. I would like to touch on a few key points on this vulnerability. Uh, first off would be the versions affected. NIST says sudo before 1.9.17p1. But if we check out the write-up from the original researchers, we can see that they only list these versions as known to be vulnerable. But they also note that they haven't tested all of them. And they say that any legacy versions of sudo uh, before this version aren't vulnerable anyways because they don't have that dash r flag. Well, moving on from that, we can see that the base score is 9.3 for the CVE, which means it's critical level. And these metrics on the side here, you see attack vector local. This is a privates escalation exploit. So an attacker has to have direct access to a system before they can run this. Attack complexity is low and privileges required is none. That means that any user on a machine can run this exploit. You can see the description for this EV right here, but in really simple terms, sudo-r tells sudo to treat a different directory as a system root. And by crafting a fake nsswitch.conf and doing a few other things, an attacker can actually trick sudo into loading a malicious module, which runs this root and thus lets us escalate privileges to root. All right, let's see this exploit in action. So I'm an unprivileged user on this device, and let me run sudo-l to check what I can run with sudo. And I can't run anything. And at the same time, there's a subdirectory under opt. And if you look on the left here, it seems that only the root user has any permissions to access this file. So if I run a ll opt no touch, I get a permission denied. But I have that exploit ready to go in my current directory, so let me run it. And just like that, I'm root. Let me look back in that uh, op no touch directory, and there we see our file. And just like that, we have successfully elevated privileges. I just showed a demo of what this exploit looks like in action, so let's go through and uh, recreate it. First, we should know what my environment looks like. I can run this command right here, and this is the version of Ubuntu I'm working with, so it's 24.4.2, and I pulled this directly off the main Ubuntu website. There's a very important note here. I didn't upgrade anything as soon as I installed Ubuntu, so completely vanilla. And the reason I didn't upgrade is because I didn't want any security patches preventing this exploit from working. Next, I can show the version of sudo. And right here, this is the version that comes by default with Ubuntu. And this also is listed as a vulnerable version in the CVE. Next up, this is the POC that I'm working with here. And it's by Proverbs. The script that actually runs the exploit can be found right here. And I don't want to go line by line through this thing, but some important parts, you can see that's making a C file and the C file later gets compiled within the same script using GCC. Now that can pose an issue, like say your target machine doesn't have GCC on it. I know GCC is not installed by default on Ubuntu desktop or Ubuntu server, but there is a way to work around that and still use this exploit. You just need to customize it some, and that would involve building out this file and compiling it on a separate system, and then transferring that to your target machine. But I'll show that in a later scenario. For now, we're just going to stick to assuming that your target machine has GCC on it. And lastly, I want to take a step back a little bit, because I think this is a good learning point. On the back end, in between edits, I actually went through and I upgraded my system. It's the same Ubuntu version. I just upgraded the system with this uh, sudo apt update command. So everything's upgraded. So what would you expect happens if I check my sudo version again? We run sudo-v, and the version hasn't changed. However, if I do that quick little check to see if the exploit works, I see something different now. 
it actually says that I'm not allowed to use the dash R option with sudo. So if we think the version didn't change, because this is reporting the same thing, well, what happened? Well, one way to check is to check the app changelog. So I'll run sudo app changelog sudo. And right here, we can see a comment mentioning a security update directly affecting this CVE that we're trying to exploit. So what this is telling me is that essentially Ubuntu is maintaining their own version of a bunch of different packages and they're just pushing their own updates and your software will get patched on the back end, even if it's not directly obvious on the front end. And this also points to that just because software on your machine happens to match a version number for a CVE on this website or anything like that doesn't necessarily mean that you are vulnerable. With that little side tangent on pseudo versions all the way, now I am back. I am in my fresh install of Ubuntu with no upgrades applied. I have to clear my screen and the next step is to install any dependencies. I will copy and paste this command. Now you can type this out or you could check back with that Docker file in the proof of concept and you know cherry pick what you want out of there. So now all of our dependencies are installed and we can use GCC later on. Next use this command to create our unprivileged user. And then we need to set the password for that user. So sudo pass wd and then the username. Next, let's switch over to our new user. And then I'm going to change my directory to the new user's home directory. So cd and home. Now I can go ahead and clear this out. And then I'll head back to Firefox to take a look at that POC. And we need to copy down this entire script. So that's copied. Head back to the terminal and I'll use nano to make a file called exploit.sh. Then I paste the whole file in there. And since we have GCC installed and we have a vulnerable version of sudo, this should work out of the box. So I will exit this. Next I need to change it to executable. So chmod plus x and then exploit.sh. And the very last step is just to run it. And just like that, we're root. So in this scenario, the POC worked out of the box. But like I mentioned earlier, what if the target machine doesn't have GCC? Well, of course, the script's going to fail because it expects that. So now I'll show this other scenario, and I'm going to roll this VM back to the, uh, the first snapshot where it's a completely vanilla install. And then I'll make that new user as I did earlier. But I won't install any other updates or any other software on the device. Okay, I've rolled back my VM and we can check if GCC is installed and it isn't. And of course I am tester one again and I am in tester one's home directory. Since our target machine doesn't have GCC installed, we're going to need a different VM instance to compile the exploit. And the original proof of concept script is going to need modifications. So we might as well do that all in one go on Kali while we're at it. All right, on this screen, I have Kali booted up, and I'm going to Firefox to look up the POC from earlier. And first step is going to be to compile this little program. That was a little bit of code. So copy all that, and then we're going to put this into a file with this name right here. I'll use nano as before. Paste that in there. But before we save it, we need to make some changes. Uh, this part right here is calling a variable. But since we've tore out the code, that variable is undefined. But we will save us some time and just hard code this as bin bash. Once that is done and everything is copied, make sure you save it. Make sure it's there. And then the next step is to compile it with GCC. And you can just pull the command directly from the exploit code. Put that in there. But before you press enter, delete this directory. Because we are not outputting this file to a different directory. We can just leave it as our current directory. So run that and I'll check and we see both files. So the compilation worked. And for the next part on Kali, we might as well build out that exploit.sh while we're at it and then just transfer it to Ubuntu when we transfer that newly compiled program. So head on back over to Firefox so we can look at that POC from earlier. To save some time, just grab the entire script and then make a exploit.sh. Paste that in there. And let's start tearing this thing apart. First, we're just doing a quick and dirty lab. We don't care about a lot of this stuff. 
So delete the stage and a uh, quick tip, I'm using control and K inside of nano to delete entire lines. So this first line with the stage gone, delete this part. We hard coded bin bash into that C code earlier. So we don't need this if then statement or any of that. So delete this line. Again, we hard coded bin bash. We can delete this variable. Earlier, we had already made this file and then compiled it with GCC, so we don't need any of this section making the file. So delete all that. And we don't need the GCC part, but don't delete it yet. We can actually just comment it out. We're going to need to add a line here, and this line is going to move our file that we transfer over to the appropriate directory. Originally, in the script, GCC's output would have put in the right place, but we don't have GCC anymore, so we have to modify it a bit. So move, and then the file name. And then we put it into that directory. And then lastly, at the end here, just delete this last line. I'm talking about stage again. So this should be good, so we can exit and save this. And the very final thing we do on Kali is set up our web server in order to transfer files. You don't have to use a web server with Python, but that's just what I like using. Especially in a lab environment like this. With all that done, let's head over back to Ubuntu. And back in Ubuntu, I'm going to grab those files of Kali. Alright, so this is the first one I'm grabbing. And the next, let's grab that exploit.sh. And make sure you don't forget to change the output file name. All right, let me check my current directory. And I will need to do chmod plus x to make exploit on sh executable. And finally, if everything is set up correctly, I should be able to run exploit on sh and get a root shell. So let's see. And it worked. Oh, who am I? Yep, I'm root. So that's pretty much all I have for this one. I thought it was a pretty fun and simple exploit to play around with. Of course, it wouldn't have been this easy without that great proof of concept published on GitHub. But yeah, if you're interested more in the back end, make sure you go check out those articles I showed earlier. And I also thought this was a pretty cool reminder that even common tools like sudo that we use all the time and don't think about can't have exploits themselves. But hopefully you learned something.